a few months ago, in a Skype cast far, far away. After credits. Episode 6, Boba Fett is a bitch. Ryan Skymetters has returned to the Patreon of Evac Station in an attempt to rescue his friend, AJ Wasolo, from the clutches of the vile YouTube gangsters at the Wisecrack channel. Little does Ryan know, the MRA Empire has secretly begun construction of a new defensive site, even more powerful than the first dreaded death Twitter. When completed, this ultimate weapon will spell certain doom for the small band of independent creators, but they can be helped by visiting patreon.com slash evacstation for less than the cost of rebuilding the relationship with your estranged father while his best friend urges you to kill one another, you can support our show. Helps keep our enemies safely encasing continent. Again, that's patreon.com slash evacstation. Welcome to the After Credits Cast, the most popular and successful film podcast on the internet, from a certain point of view. I am your host, Aaron J. Iwakseska, and with me today, for the final time in this trilogy anyway, is the Darth Metters. <clears throat> little, uh, hello, hello. A little uncomfortable with those breathing, that breathing over there. <laughs> I haven't been practicing that sound effect since I was, like, six. Of course not. I mean, you never really don't know how to do it, though. It's like riding a bike. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, speaking of never forgetting, I'm never going to forget to remind you guys about the links down below. We have uh, Patreon, YouTube, Peepa, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podcast Addict. You can find us in all those different locations if you want to listen to us on your platform of choice. And as always, on those platforms, give us ratings, five stars, gives us uh, more people looking for us on the various platforms, more views, helps us out, so definitely give us a review if you can. And if you want to reach out to us, you can also find us on social media, that is Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. Leave comments down below, tell us who your favorite Ewok was, and why you don't want to punt them out off the, off the planet into the sun. And, if you want to reach out to us directly, you can also go to uh, our email. Ryan, where is that email? Uh, that email is give in to your anger. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. That's evacstation at gmail.com. Indeed. Uh, before we get too far into things, we'll kick off this segment with, or this, uh, video, series, podcast, whatever we're doing, uh, with our usual segment, Whatcha Been Watching? Ryan, it's been a hot minute since we recorded. We had a little bit of a break for us. Uh, these guys don't notice the difference though, because we just did something last week. Uh, so, for us, Ryan, what have you been watching? Um, well, I recently discovered and then subsequently binge-completed um, the show The Good Place um, that I found on Netflix. Uh, found out that it originally aired on NBC. Uh, the third season was recently up to, uploaded to Netflix, and the fourth and final season will be uh, debuting on the 26th of September, uh, which you guys have already seen, but for us, we have not gotten there as of yet. This show is really, really good. It's hilarious in the in its premise, where the, uh, the, the main group of protagonists are in heaven. They're dead, and they're in uh, what's known as the good place, which is essentially the real-life version of the beneficial place of the afterlife. Uh, only problem is the main character actually doesn't belong there because Heaven made a bureaucratic error and um, they mixed her up with somebody who's named exactly the same as her but also died at the same moment. Uh, she was supposed to end up at the bad place and the other one in the good place, but they got switched. So she has to learn how to be good in order to stay in Heaven without anybody else figuring out that she's not supposed to be there. This sounds goofy as fuck. <laughs> It's it's amazingly goofy, but it's also really, really smart um, because they go about various forms of ethics and philosophy, and they actually manage to tie in a lot of really highbrow concepts into the story. The plot's fantastic. 
the humor is just, it's just constantly popping and it makes you laugh all the time, but it also really makes you think. So I cannot suggest this enough. It's really, really good. Nice, nice. Um, well, for my week, Ryan, I've got a couple things that I've done. I, I'm going to get us all caught up here real quick. Yes. Uh, so speaking of goofy things, I finished two goofy shows. I finished Parks and Recreation. Yes. And a uh, quick, uh, quick fi uh, final review on, the, uh, on it. Uh, first six seasons are absolute solid gold, and you must check them out. Seventh season is not perfect. I don't think it's bad. I think it's just losing some of the spark that made the first six so good. See, that's what I said. <laughs> it was like, it's good, but it's if you're comparing it to the other six, then yeah, it's it's, it's not as good. Yeah, and, I th and then one thing that bugged me the most is that they had kids at the end of the sixth season, and you never see the kids in the seventh season. <laughs> <laughs> so, like they keep talking about them like they're there but we never see them and I'm like um okay I guess they didn't really have kids after all it's fine I'm gonna show you a really a really funny uh scene that they uh, extended scene that they decided to cut out uh of the of the last season it's actually really hilarious I'll show it to you later on nice nice um another show I started and finished because it's a short series as it always is uh glow season three Oh my god. Oh, you said funny things. Oh, man. Admittedly, Go season three is a rough one, but it's uh, but rough in the way that it's worth watching. It's really good. It's really fun. I yeah. It's it's heavy. Like it's really good, but it's it's heavy at times. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Bash continuously takes me by surprise. They always do it where they have the majority of him being like a moron and then like towards the end of the season he gets like some real deep character moments and you're just like, oh shit, Bash, I'm so sorry. Every season has surprised me and impressed me with what they've done. Like it's a goofy concept on its, on, uh, at its face, but it's got a lot of layers to it. It's got so many good characters and actresses. I honestly don't know how they're going to do the next season with it seems like some of the characters are actually leaving. I don't know if they are leaving or not, but it feels like they're trying to leave and not for bad reasons. I mean, they're ending their arcs in ways that make sense. So I don't know. I'm very curious to see what happens next. I really want to know. Well, remember at the end of the first season when Cherry was attempting to leave, they managed to bring her back. Oh, yeah, I know. I didn't But um, yeah, everything about this show is still hitting every chord with me that, I, that, that makes it good. So... Yeah, if you have not seen Glow on Netflix, do yourself a favor and watch it because you are missing out on something great. Yes, guys, please. And if you're, you're like, you don't have to be a wrestling fan oh, I'm not to at all. really I love enjoy it. this show. Wouldn't it, uh, like, you don't have to be a wrestling fan to to, re to enjoy the show. But if you are a wrestling fan, it's that much better. Because it's <laughs> really, really, like, in-depth and it goes into things about the business. It really, like, it... Like, they, they managed to make a couple of asides that just, real wrestling fans, they, they know exactly what they're talking about. They're like, oh, man, it gives it just that much more authenticity. So I love it. And then one final thing I'm going to mention, because, Ryan, it came out recently, and i got to talk about it. Fucking Banjo-Kazooie in Smash. How is he? So... I didn't grow up into the Banjo-Kazooie games. Uh, I came into the N64 late, and by the time I was really into it, GameCube was coming out. So I missed most of the game, uh, N64 stuff. So I missed Banjo-Kazooie mm -hmm. by extension. Um, but playing uh, the character in this game, he is incredibly easy to pick up and not too difficult to get a good handle with. Um, I don't think he's one of my best characters, but I don't think he's going to be in my bottom tiers either. I think he's definitely a strong middle Probably, like, around Mario level. Like, something fun I can pick mm. up and play without feeling too, like, underwhelming with him. So. Okay, okay, okay. Um, good, good recovery options. Uh, strong hits. Good combos. A little slow, he but has it makes a, sense. He has, a, he has a bird in his backpack. I would hope he has good recovery options. I would say the one that I'm not a big fan of is when you lock him into a special move where he shoots the eggs out toward, uh, towards his front. Um, if you hold the button, he shoots it out repeatedly, but it's hard to switch out. It's not super simple to switch out right away. You have to, like, do a dodge roll or something, which in my head I'm not thinking. I'm trying to do a smash attack or something right out of it, and I just shoot right. more eggs. So it, it's something I have to get used to. But uh, unlike Joker or Bayonetta, who are more technical characters, he's definitely more of a power character, which is absolutely fine. Um, and then I don't know if any, I don't know if you saw it, Ryan, but they announced Terry Bogard for the next character in the Smash. Harry Bogart? Uh, so, are you familiar with the Final Fight series? No. Uh, or King of Fighters? 
I've heard the name King of Fighters, but I haven't played. So King of Fighters is an SNK uh, developed series, which is more popular in South America, which is where a lot of the fans for this series and this character are coming from. But okay. um, it's the Street Fighter of South America, basically. All right, all right, all right. And, I can dig that. And so while a lot of people I know personally aren't super into this guy, there is a huge contention of South American fans as well as just fighting game fans in general who are, like, really hyped for this guy. So, yeah. No, it's pretty cool. Damn. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to jump back on. I, I, I need to... I need to I need to up my game if I'm gonna come visit you. Cause <laughs> holy shit, y'all are y'all are for real. Yeah, we had we had the bachelor party just recently, and uh, I, I think I cleaned up pretty good there. <laughs> you, you 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 did you you did, <laughs> sir. <laughs> hey, I, I, you gotta admit, Joker and I we 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 get, we're a good combo. We we did good. Oh we yeah, good. oh yeah. Oh, speaking of which, I got my mask for Joker finally too. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So yeah, I'm all I'm all ready for the wedding that just that already happened for those listening. But for us, it's, <laughs> it's still a month away. <laughs> God, we time is weird. <laughs> Speaking of time, I think it's time we get to our uh, movie of the week. What do you say? Indeed, let's go. This week's film, it's the end of the original trilogy today, and is 1983's Return of the Jedi, written by Lawrence Kasdan and George Lucas, and directed by Richard Marquand. I think that's how you pronounce that. Yeah, I think you got that. Yeah. Yeah. This film would go on to gross a cumulative worldwide total of $475,347, which is roughly 14 times the cost. They really are good at getting that turnaround. Oh, yeah. Another success for our cast, which includes Frank Oz, Peter Mayhew, Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker, Ian McDermott, Billy D. Williams, Alec Guinness, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, and both David Prowse and James Earl Jones as Darth Vader. Oh, and, and Sebastian Shaw as Anakin Skywalker. I mean, I mean Hayden Christensen. I mean, ah! <laughs> Grumbles. We'll have words. We'll have words. Um, I actually didn't write down any questions for the remaster edition stuff this time around. We'll have to talk about that more. We'll have to remind me about that. Um, awards. This movie has 22 wins and 20 nominations, including Special Achievement for Visual Effects in the Academy Awards, a BAFTA Film Award for Best Visual Effects, a Saturn, Saturn Awards for Best Sci-Fi, Best Actor, Best Costumes, Best Makeup, and Best Special Effects from the Academy of Sci-Fi, Fantasy, and Horror, all well-deserved. Mm. Another Golden Spirit Award for John Williams as Composer, no surprise there. Of course. And a People's Choice Award for Favorite Motion Picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With with a fourteen times estimated turnaround, um, yeah, I can say the people like enjoyed this movie. <laughs> Indeed, um, there 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 are some vocal critics about this film, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but this is definitely the first divisive film of the franchise, if we're going in order of release. I'd think that's fair. That's that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. It gets worse as the series goes on, and we'll discuss that here. <laughs> In our next episode uh, or two. <laughs> God. No, no, do not, do not get me frustrated before we talk about one of my favorite movies. <laughs> uh, so, so just so you know, Ryan, I've watched ahead since I had a little bit extra time between recordings, and I watched Last Jedi, and I'm still pretty, pretty happy with it. So we'll, we'll, we'll have some positive things and address a lot of that controversy here in a couple episodes. So we'll get to it. I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the rewatch now that I've had like a couple of years in between. Like I, I definitely, I can't, I can't wait to move on to the next two movies so we can t look at them with a fresh eye. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we do have some fun facts for this particular one. Yeah. Would you like me to get to those? Go right ahead. All right. All right. So following the success of Boba Fett appearing in comics and being a popular supporting character, George Lucas admitted that he had no idea that the character had become so popular. He mentioned that if he had known, he would have given the bounty hunter a more memorable death scene. Lucas even considered adding a shot of Boba Fett escaping the Sarlacc for the 2004 DVD release. Ultimately, he decided against it, as he did not want viewers to be distracted from the intended storyline. That's perfectly fine, because Boba Fett and the Mandalorians were treated much, much better in the extended universe that now no longer exists, but that's neither here But here. Ryan, we're getting a Mandalorian TV show. You know what? We are, and it looks fucking awesome, so I can't be <laughs> mad at that anymore. Like, like, I feel like they're about to do right by the Mandalorian. We'll see. So I'm, we'll see. I'm, cool. I'm, 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 I'm cool. curious. 
<laughs> I am curious too. Next up, uh, fake scripts were distributed to some cast members that were considered likely to leak information to the media. Sounds, sounds like some we have Tom these, Holland over here. I know, I know. <laughs> some of these phony story elements were indeed leaked, such as Lando being revealed as the last hope for the Jedi, mentioned by Obi-Wan and Yoda in Star Wars Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back. I wonder who was given that script. I'm at a... I'm at a Yes, Billy D, but I, I'd love to go back in time and Billy find out. Billy, why? Billy. He goes up on Letterman's like, yeah, no, I totally am the guy who's going to save everybody. It's in the script. Yep, yep, yep. I got it. I brought the copy on air. I mean, <clears throat> just... all right. Last but not least, Hayden Christensen mentioned in an interview that he didn't fully know what George Lucas was up to when he inserted into the special edition, uh, of course, uh, that spectral forest ghost of young Anakin Skywalker. Otherwise, he would have played the scene totally different. Faster, more intense. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, 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 won't, I won't be too mad at him for that. Like, in all honesty, I didn't know that they had him, that, that they had him re-record stuff. I thought they had, like, lifted... Foot like footage off of like B rolls of like uh, episode three. two and episode three yeah. to try to, and just put it in. So I mean I won't be I can't begrudge him for that if he didn't know what the fuck the scene was when he was acting it up. But if they were going through the liberty of like, well I mean no that would be like super far back like super far before that. No yeah I don't know why they wouldn't just tell him yeah we want to put you in the in episode six so just he, do here's this. my here's my thing and I think I'm gonna I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous films when we talked about the prequel trilogy so if I didn't I apologize but I'm gonna bring it up here. I think the world has the the fan base of Star Wars to be to be more specific has been too hard on this Hayden Christensen guy. They were really hard on the guy who played Jar Jar Binks as well, but that's a long story. It's already got a documentary. No, we're not going to get into that. But, Poor guy. But uh, Hayden Christensen, he worked with what he had, guys. I mean, you, you guys saw the script. You saw what fucking Ewan McGregor had to say. He made that work because Ewan McGregor is a fucking talent, okay? Hayden Christensen's not Ewan McGregor, but he fucking tried. He really fucking did. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that Hayden Christensen is one of the greatest actors of all time. He's really not. But he did not. De- he did not deserve like all of the, the the grief that he was given. He, it's like it, it was. It was a limited actor working on a very limited script. So it's just like, well, damn. What, what are you gonna do? Like, what, what, what are you gonna do, guys? I am. I imagine if we had the directors from Empire and Return of the Jedi on hand to help out, they probably would have directed him in a way that would have probably helped him out more. They also probably would have beat the hell out of some of those writers for the uh, for what they gave him, but that's another story. Wait, wait, writers? I thought it was just George. <laughs> God damn it, George! This is why you have other people in the room, so they could be like, "No, man, that's dumb." Um, let's go. No, no, George. This isn't how humans talk. It's just not. <laughs> let's get some initial thoughts going real quick. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. This is often contention with Empire for me for the film I enjoy most of this whole franchise. We discussed that a little bit last week. This time around, I took a little more analytical approach when watching this, and I could definitely see more of the holes than I care to admit, but I will say it's still a fun movie all the same. That's good. That's good and concise. I will try to keep mine as concise. It's it's actually in a similar vein. This definitely... This was my favorite growing up, um, and... Looking back, I can now see it's because I really like I really like it when big storylines come together in a nice in a nice bow. Yeah, that, nice that's always been my thought. The conclusion is like this is a really good conclusion. And, and I, I I feel like the conclusion in and of itself is really good, but I also I think um, there's the conclu- it, like the movie consists of the conclusion and a good deal more padding mm-hmm. to just bulk up the movie and it's really good padding and it's re- it's really awesome stuff and you want to be there for every minute of every minute of it but it's kind of fluff when you're looking at like the actual storylines so i mean it's still great it's still great but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well speaking of padding out the runtime let's get to our synopsis shall we <laughs> let's do it <laughs> 
We spend our first 40 minutes watching Luke and his friends bubble around Jabba's palace to try and rescue Han. After three unsuccessful attempts, Jabba says fuck it and decides to throw Han, Chewie, and Luke into the dreaded Sarlacc pit. Fighting happens, Leia chokes out the big slug, a blind Han slaps uh, Bubba Fett into the pit, and Luke uh, just slays a bunch of motherfuckers before taking off to Dagobah to reunite with Yoda. Meanwhile, the Emperor and Darth Vader are building a new Death Star, which is fully staffed because they found people gullible enough to work on a second one of these things. They discuss plans to corrupt Luke into their dark side, which seems like it would be a lot easier since the Jedi are dying and their lies are exposed to Luke, who doesn't seem all that happy to learn the truth about his father, or his sister Leia. Gross. <laughs> the heroes reunite on the moon of Endor, where uh, plans are devised to blow up the half-assed Death Star, Taking it down, or t uh, to take down the shields, uh, the shield generators, Han, Luke, and Leia are sent down to the planet. They partner up with the local bear, Care Bear militia to deal with the stormtroopers. But Luke's senses, uh, uh, Luke Skywalker senses tingling as Darth Vader arrives on the planet. He tells Leia the truth about their incestuous relationship before t uh, taking up to hang out with dear old daddy. When we, sp uh, we spend the final 40 minutes of the film going back and forth between the ground team uh, trying to bring down the shield and the space team attempting to attack the Death Star. All while Luke is stuck in the throne room with Vader and the Emperor, who really just likes to go on monologuing. <laughs> Fighting happens. Luke is given a shocking experience when he refuses to join the dark side, which Vader does not take too kindly to. He throws the Emperor, his boss, into the reactor shaft and, you know, rebels. Lando leads the strike team to finish off the Death Star. Luke drags his dad uh, to an escape pod before removing his life support system so they can see each other face to face. Uh, the galaxy celebrates the momentous defeat of the, of the Empire, but the work is not done. Factors of the Empire and secret plans of Palpatine still exist in the far corners of the star systems. We'll find out more about that during the Disney era. Oh boy. Just, I'm so, I'm still so bad. <laughs> I'm still so mad because the EU handled it wonderfully, but the Oh, okay, okay. Before we jump into questions, I am curious. So, so, so what? So, what do you mean exactly? Because I, I am very not versed in the EU at all. I, I know the Sith era stuff and the Clone Wars stuff. I know nothing beyond the the uh, Return of the Jedi. Well, I mean, they do a lot. Um, they do a lot of exploration um, into like the uh, the remnants of the Empire. Um, like they like the plans of Palpatine that are still like going on even past his death. Like he has a couple of like he's trained like force sensitive assassins, not fully in the arts of the Sith, but just so that there's really spooky ass assassins um, to like go after the people that kill him when he's dead. Uh, we learn more about the nature of the Force. We learn just about how old Palpatine is and why he made this entire plan to take over the galaxy because he knew about another race of people that were coming from another galaxy. And it was just, they did a lot with the EU and it was really well set up. And I'm really sad that it's gone still. So I guess the question is, would you prefer the DC, did the Disney, uh, sorry, the Disney, uh, era to start pulling more from the EU, or do you kind of like that they're doing something different? I mean, I liked that they were doing something different. We'll get to that in the next couple of, of weeks. That's fair, that's fair. Um, I, I won't dive in too deep, but I was just kind of curious what your thoughts were on that one. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not mad at, like, new stories being created, because um, while the EU was really well set up, there was also, it was like, three decades of books and they're just like guys if we're gonna make movies off of this there's too much shit to pull from there's too much stuff to do and they opted to just do something new instead of trying to fit into this really well established uh canon so it, I, I get it i get it speaking of things it's just it's still just a little sore that's all speaking of things being non-canon you can get star wars jedi outcast 2 on the switch right now <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so first question I got for you regarding this movie, Ryan. Um, well, actually, but before I get to that, uh, so overall, what are your thoughts now that we got to the end of this? What do you think? Good, bad? Where, where, where do you land on this one for sure? I still, I still really like this movie. I still very much like this movie. Um, when I when I think about it, um, the first movie really like brings a a holistic kind of adventure vibe 
to the to the series. The second movie is definitely much more plot driven, much more story focused. It still manages to keep that feel of adventure, but it's definitely more plot driven as the protagonists are like actually going about missions trying to do stuff. Although it feel like 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 Luke is. Luke is trying to go off and do things, but kind of the rest of them are bouncing around the plans of the Empire. I know we talked about that last week. Mm-hmm. This third movie feels like kind of a mix in between the two. And the story really seems to focus on Luke and his and his uh journey, his uh his mission to try and save his father from the dark side, despite him being literally a child murderer. Um, uh, while the others are just like, oh, by the way, we have to destroy this Death Star. Okay, well, I guess we, well, first we have to go save Han. Let's go do that. And then, okay, let's try and blow up this half-assed Death Star. Oh my God, it's actually working. Oh shit. And Luke is over here having a moral conundrum, <laughs> talking to the guy that's been whispering poison in his father's ear uh, for the past, like, three decades. Kill them all, Vader. <laughs> No, but I was gonna say, um, he, he may have been a child murderer, but at least he wasn't a pedophile. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a line he didn't cross, and I approve of this. I, I approve of this. <laughs> I do approve of that. Uh, okay, so we have some questions regarding this film. And I try to make them deeper. I try to go for more deep questions and less, like, just goofy questions. But we'll see what we get. We'll see what we get. All right. Uh, first off, while the first segment of Java's Palace is necessary to reunite the main cast, is there a better way this could have been handled? Was there, a, uh, was there a plan to rescue Han, or did everyone just kind of have different plans and they all failed? Because uh, this first segment does seem a little messy. Not bad, just kind of a little chaotic. Yeah, so I have a feeling that... Uh, I have a feeling that Leia and Lando had a plan, and Luke who has been off doing spooky, mysterious Jedi things, also had a plan. And they both tried to enact those plans and it didn't work out. Um, And it was only when they were able to get on the same page all together and the group was able to reunite that they were able to actually escape. Um, Meta, like on a meta level, I feel like the this segment is so long because they want to really showcase how far these people have come how, like leia has come has really come into her own she's working with lando and like like working with these like she's blending into the like this layer of scoundrels because she's like come so far and then luke shows up all spooky with his cloak and his brand new green lightsaber um which how the fuck do you even make a lightsaber apparently he learned that Amongst, uh, amidst his more intensive Jedi training that he's been doing off screen. So I feel like the segment is so long because it's kind of a montage as how far they've come between two and three. If that makes any sense. I can see that too, because there are some lines dropped by uh, C3 that make it that, that kind of harken back to that first film, especially because they're back on Tatooine and they're mm-hmm. going through all this stuff. So you, you can kind of get the idea they're trying to call, call back on that. Um,. And I, and I, yeah, it's almost like they're trying to come full circle. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. And um, you could probably also see the seams a little bit in the sense that um, in the previous film, Han was possibly going to die. And even Harrison Ford was like, I don't want to come back. I don't want, I think Han should be dead. There was debates on whether that should be the case or not. Ultimately, he's back, of course. And I'm going to guess this scene was probably one of the last ones filmed, just because they probably were unaware of how... Well, I guess Han's in the rest of the movie, so... Maybe, maybe not, but I, I'm going to guess that this scene was probably one of the last ones planned because they weren't quite sure how to bring him back just yet, is, is my theory. Mm. And it kind of ran long, I'm, I'm going to guess, compared to what they were originally intending to do. Actually, that does kind of make a little bit of sense because a good portion of the Endor stuff was ju- was Luke and Leia doing things. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they had... They didn't have they didn't have a whole bunch of scenes where it was just Han doing stuff, but rather it was okay now now that we've finally got Harrison locked in, let's film a couple of uh, extra scenes with Han and Leia doing doing the thing, and we can fully we can fully flesh out their romance as well uh, in the in the back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely can see that that might be part of the issues as well. Um, I don't hate this segment by any means, but I do think it's a weird diversion from the main plot for sure 
Yeah, it it it's it 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 almost has an adventure for the sake of adventure feel. Yep. Because like you you know they need to get Han back, uh, and they need to get the group together. But they're also like, but we're also like, guys, we have to like destroy the Empire in this movie, and we're on forty minutes now. <laughs> Can we actually get to? The whole empire thing. We're 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 fucking with a crime boss here. What are we? What are we doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's weird too because Jabba is such a minor villain compared to the Empire. It's like I don't understand why you guys are struggling so hard with this. I mean, I get that there's a bunch of bounty hunters, sure, but had y'all come in with this plan with this plan of uh, in, in, in like one united front, this wouldn't have been a problem for any of you. Like Luke alone is, is your big gun. The rest of you guys just kind of do the cleanup. I mean, it, it wouldn't be that difficult, but it is what it is. I- I, I, I feel like it's also indicative of how kind of mysterious and aloof Luke has become in the past couple of years. Yeah. I, I, like, like, like it's it's kind of hard to nail Luke down in one place because he's off doing fucking whatever, but he went off for a couple of months and came back and now has a green laser sword and is really telekinetic the fuck i'm assuming there's like some eu comics or something like that that explain where he was in the in the in between time but i'd love to see more details on it because i feel like it's just it reminds me of the skip from attack of the clones to revenge of the sith where there's a lot of like little things i would love to have seen like the general grievous stuff and all that and all that and i feel like here we're missing like the the critical like luke becoming fully a jedi mode at that point you know what i mean yeah, but I also like the way they handled it in this time around because it doesn't, it like so when you consider the end of Empire mm-hmm. and how he's been training, his powers are getting stronger, you know, and he was actually able to stand up to Vader for a little bit, but then he got grievously wounded and he got his ass kicked and he's like, oh shit, and I found out this is just my father, and you can tell he like that tempered him a little bit. So after getting his ass kicked and really sitting down to think about it a couple years go by and he's like this more calm collected patient wise like mysterious figure that is also like now uh, damn near a fully fledged jedi knight i like that transaction transition it makes sense to me that's fair that's fair and i do think they do a good job at least showing his abilities and showing his growth and not telling us. Like, I think they do a good job with the show, don't tell. So, k- kudos mm-hmm. on that much, at least. Um, okay, next question. How are the differences between the Empire and the Rebellion forces exemplified in this film? And what do you think these differences say about the conflict of these two sides? I mean... The differences between the two sides... I mean, I, it's... The the rebellion feels more like a collaboration of like-minded, near equal individuals that have come together for a cause, whereas the empire is completely united by fear. Um, you saw a lot of that in Empire with uh, Vader just going through higher ranking uh, officers and generals because they failed him, and nobody can really step out of line unless they want to get force choked. So the all of the power really focuses on Vader and the Emperor mm-hmm. on the Empire side. And as those two collapse, the rest of it just kind of crumbles. Whereas all of the various factions and uh, members of the Alliance, of the Rebel Alliance, they can act in tandem with each other and trust of the others to do their job. So if one person falls, the whole thing doesn't come up. At least that's the that was the big thing for me that I noticed. Um, I'll 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 agree and add an addendum to it. Um, so what I noticed is with the rebellion forces, it's a, it's a unification of these different factions. Yes, but uh, it's it's a multi race racial faction. You have all these different species of aliens, these different people from all these different walks of life, all uniting against this empire, who by and large are just a bunch of really stuffy white dudes and suits basically yeah very true, um very true. so it, 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 to hearken it to anything it's kind of like 300 but in reverse where the empire i.e you know the three at the spot or, or kind of like the spartans are all just one uniform group of people but unlike the 300 you know situation they're the ones in power 
versus uh, what was it? What was the other faction in Three Hundred called again? I can't, I fucking, the Persians. The Persians. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I forgot the word. Um, everyone else represents kind of the Persians or the Covenant or whatever other group of multi-racial groups you you want to say are uniting. Except instead of you know being the force of evil, they're the force of good. And it's just kind of interesting to see that trope flipped on its head, but it also kind of makes sense, especially when you look at modern politics today. You know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely, definitely. So, can we? Uh, can, are, are we gonna call the Rebel Alliance the minor, the minor team? Yes, we should. <laughs> uh, when, when someone else makes a good pun, I I feel like I might can pass the torch on. I can die happy now. <laughs> um, but there's also the there's also another uh, another element to this too, which is the technology versus the the, the more natural side of things. Because later in the film, we get introduced to the Ewoks, where you have. Uh, these little bears using all the power of nature with these, like, you know, uh, put, slap together traps of, like, you know, logs and whatnot um, against these big machines. So there, there's another element there as well, and I'm not really sure what that says, but it does kind of harken to the line that they say, that, that uh, Obi-Wan says, where Vader is more machine than man, and so there's kind of a struggle between, you know, the more natural forces uh, of the Rebellion versus the more mechanical, heartless forces of the Empire. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you could also make the argument about um, how the Rebel Alliance is much more respectful of nature uh, co coexisting with it and uh, using, like, not necessarily just consuming it to, uh, to further advance their purpose, like the Empire, but rather working alongside of nature to achieve a sort of a more natural sort of balance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that argument could also be made. Yep. Um, next here. So let's see, did I do this in the right order? I don't know if I did. Uh, okay, so it's, said, it's been said that Mark Hamill pushed for a darker, more ominous ending for Luke, where uh, he turns to the dark side. Would you have wanted to see this take... And what do you think that would have looked like going forward? So, here's the thing. <laughs> They've kind of bet it all on Luke at this point. Yeah, he's kind, he's kind of the Michael Jordan of this team. He's the MVP. He, yeah, I mean, like, if, if, if Luke actually goes to the dark side, sure, the, like, sure, they might, uh, like, they might actually... Like, take out the Death Star. Maybe. Maybe. But you still have at least three, possibly two, you know, if, if, the, if the Emperor was like, hey, uh, go on ahead and kill him to complete your training. So, yeah, you'd still have two. But you'd also have Luke, who knows everything about the Rebel Alliance, a very young, very powerful, very fresh, new, like, Sith Lord... And nobody on the Rebellion side is anywhere close to being able to fight that guy one-on-one. -on -one. So, the, like, the fact that Luke had gotten so powerful and was able to actually take on the head of the Empire, that's, like, the main reason why they won. If he turned, I can't see them winning. So, I'll say this. I'm sorry, winning in the long run. Right, right, I should right. I should clarify. Like, the Death Star would have been destroyed without Luke because Luke didn't really do anything in that fight. But I think long term, like Luke actually defeating the Empire and Vader is really what solidified the win. So I'll say this, I'll say this. I think Luke going full dark side would have been a mistake. I respect Mark Hamill's, you know, desire, because I think he does play really good villains. And I think that that might have been what he was trying to do was maybe stretch his acting talent a bit. I'm not going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, for this film, an, a more ominous ending, not necessarily going to the dark side, but maybe, like, introducing the concept of the Grey Jedi the, the, the or something like that. I could have been on board for that, because that would have still left the door open for something different something weirder to happen going forward and we do still see luke kind of adopt that great jedi mentality in the disney era stuff but um I, th I think hinting towards it would have been interesting i i feel like i feel like leaving the door open like that would have called for more movies and i feel like they wanted to put the button on it well well lucas did at least <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Lucas wanted to put the button on it. Like, it's a trilogy, 
We're gonna end it. It's a girl. Like we're, we're we're gonna cash in the chips, go home while we're ahead. And that I, I understand that. I understand that, and I appreciate the button placed on it. Um, there is the, like the thing about the 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 mythos that he's created with the Star Wars saga is that it's still so open ended. Like the like Return of the Jedi ending is the ending of one story. But the universe that he created was so wide open that they were able to do a lot of stuff with it. I keep mentioning the EU. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> they, Well they, no, no, they, you're you're not wrong. Return of the Jedi is the launching point, I think, for most of what the EU is. Yeah, definitely. So, definitely. so I mean, bringing so, up in a conversation is not unheard of at all. I think it's perfectly fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, like to like TLDR. I don't think like making him evil at that point in time would have been like would have been good for the story. I don't think it would have been well received by audiences at the time because we're talking like 1980s. Yeah. Like like no nobody's going to go and see like the 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 ending of this major worldwide phenomenon trilogy only to be like, "Oh, the hero just said fuck it and killed everybody at the end." 20, what? 2019 <laughs> he could get away with it. In two, in the 80s probably not. Yeah. Um, what do I got next? Um, okay. How does this film hit on the themes of redemption? Do you feel that redemption was even earned? Who has earned it? Is it just Darth Vader seeking redemption, or are there others? I mean, I don't think... I don't think Vader... I would argue that Vader wasn't seeking redemption. <laughs> I mean, no, but I, he got it at the end, though, I think. He did. He, he did get it. He did... He did um, I, I would argue... See, so so you 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 ask a deep philosophical question because we have, you have to consider what the hell do you what the hell even is redemption at this certain point in time, especially having seen the previous trilogy and knowing more about Vader than we do now than people did in the original movies. Like Vader did some bad shit. <laughs> he did some bad stuff. Does that like does him killing the Emperor? make up for decades of terror that he inflicted on a galactic scale well i don't know so so there's a show i've been watching recently i'm gonna i'm gonna save the details of it for next week from what you're watching but there's a show i've been watching on netflix called rookie moms check it out it's really good um in the second season the husband of the main couple has an affair family breaks up in the third season there's a line that's dropped in regards to this, and they seem like they're getting back together, but it's not clear. Season four's not out yet, so who knows? But uh, there's a line that's dropped that is in regards to this saying, uh, "Just because uh, uh, someone who does so a good person can do one bad thing, but doesn't mean that they're st that it doesn't mean they're a bad person." Now, in the case of Darth Vader, he did a lot of bad things. That's that, that that's that's fair, but. I don't th I I don't think that necessarily means he's incapable of coming back from that. Um. And I know that's like saying, "Oh, well, Trump did a bunch of horrible things," but I don't. But he's not, he, it doesn't mean he's incapable of coming back from that. No, he, he's incapable. He, but I think it's I think it's a difference of not the actions per se, but the desire to come back from it. Trump doesn't want to come back from any of his bullshit. He he owns it and, and and is reveling in the in the hatred. I think at the end of this, Vader is seeing that the, it's become personal for him and he's seen what his actions have brought and he's realizing at this point finally that mistakes have been made and he wants to fix it he wants to do he, what he can to rectify the errors he's made um and i think it's the fact that he does want that change he does want to f uh, undo what he's done i think that desire is the, the is a right step for redemption whether he's earned it or not in the eyes of his peers that's kind of up to the individual but i do think that is what he's trying to do at the end i largely agree with what you're saying um <laughs> i like no, no no i i do i do i do i think my only con my only different the only different like argument that i would make is that he wasn't looking for redemption <laughs> And thus, I don't think he's largely deserving of it for the majority of the movie. But I would argue that he wasn't looking for it 
because he didn't think it was possible. And it took not only his son, like like not only like the 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 possibility of getting closer to his son, the last remnants of and good on the writers for this, like for connecting um Amidala uh, 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 Padme's like death in such a way that it actually makes this a little more impactful on the second like viewing of it. But you now have the remnants of his like like the love of his life who died because of him mm-hmm. has now been discovered now wants to get closer to him and still thinks that there's good in him. It's almost like Padme was calling out from beyond saying, despite all you've done, there is still good in you. And it's only as Luke is constantly trying and trying and trying. And then finally, like Luke is is about to die at the hands of the emperor that he really wants that, 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 that switch clicks and he gives up like everything that he's done thus far to try and live up to his potential. So I definitely agree with it. I just think the switch happens like at the very last minute. Oh yeah, no, I agree. Does with that, that mean too. he? Does that mean he earned it? I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a big ass argument. I I honestly don't know if I could say that everything is all good and he deserves to stand there with Yoda and Obi Wan at the end around the campfire. I can't say that, but. I do like the the emotional impact of that and how the defeat wasn't one of martial might, even though Luke beat him. It was of emotional of, fo- like it was emotional. It was a familial bond where he proved to be stronger than him. It, like his son proved to be stronger than him and still held to the ties of the Jedi, the teachings that he was taught so long ago, and the purity and goodness that his mother has has instilled in him just from birth. I love that shit. That's a a fantastic bow to put on his arc. Mm -hmm. And and not to stand this question too long, because I have a few more left to go, and we are going a little long here, but um, I, I would say other characters who might have fallen into this redemption theme would maybe be like the the force ghosts who uh you know weren't honest with Luke and they're also trying to make up for the failures they had back in episode 3 uh through the events of this film uh helping bring balance to the force in in, in an indirect way um you have Lando who obviously is not a major player here i mean he does have some moments but he doesn't really do a whole lot directly with these main characters he's kind of you know part of the flight crew doing all that shit um and and all these different all these little bits and pieces all coming together to kind of help reinforce this redemption theme a little bit. Obviously, the main thrust of that arc is this Vader Luke relationship, but it's definitely prevalent throughout the film. Hands down. Now, now, uh, damn it! I'm sorry because I know we have to move on, but <laughs> you you just you just brought up a really good point that I want to ask you. Do you feel that Obi Wan and Yoda need redemption? Are not telling Luke, Luke, Luke the truth. Um, I think the redemption that Obi- I think it's different. I think Obi Wan seeks a redemption from his failures in Episode Three. I think that's ultimately what he is feeling. I think he feels he failed Anakin. He failed the the, the, the galaxy in his inability to put Vader down and to train him properly in the first place. And maybe he doesn't blame himself entirely, but I do think there's some level of guilt that has haunted him, which is why he was unable to move on until he faced Darth Vader in Episode 4. And I think that's why he still hangs around with Luke in these later episodes to kind of help finish what he started. Um, as for their honesty with Luke, I don't know if there's any... I don't know if that necessarily holds them back. I, I think if that was an issue, they would have told him sooner. And maybe, it's, and maybe the writing isn't quite there to support this, but I don't know if that is a big deal for them. Um, and I'm not really sure how Yoda feels about it, about the past or anything. I feel like his loss of Sidious, Sidious's words, um, hits him pretty hard, but I don't know if he necessarily feels guilty of that loss. I think he understands that it was a fight he just simply couldn't win. 
So I'm not sure on that mm. one. I like that. I, 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 I very much like that. Well done, sir. Mm-hmm. I, I try. I try. <laughs> um, next question here. A major criticism levied at this film uh, from both cast and critics is the push to sell more toys over telling a good story. From the Ewoks to bringing Han back from into the fold, what are your thoughts on this critique of Lucas, and is it fair? Does it hold up? Uh, does the story hold up beyond these critiques? Mm. I I don't think. Like I'm, I'm trying to give a, con, a more concise answer. I know I like to ramble. Um, no, no, no for, I, feel, feel free to ramble. Feel free to ramble. I don't think the story suffered too much at the desire to sell more merchandise. I think I, I think the IP in and of itself is rife with merchandising things. Lightsabers, Ewoks, ships, speeders, t -t -t fucking Boba Fett. I just like like ev everything. Everything in that was essentially product placement for Lucas's like idea brainchild. Uh, to sell tons of merch. So I don't think that the story in and of itself suffered because of that. Um, I I feel like there wasn't too much else to do with the movie. Like like the, 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 the main focuses of the movie were destroy the Empire, have Luke, uh, like Luke and Vader's redemption arc come to a close. Those were like the big things that needed to happen. And, it, and they, they told those two things pretty concisely. Like the, the, the first thing, destroy the empire, in and of itself included a massive space battle that was gonna have to take place when they were like, oh, we're making another Death Star. That automatically had to happen. Like the Ewoks being necessary, not really, but I don't think they hurt the story either. I think product placement for, like, to be able to sell teddy bears? Sure. Okay. But also, I don't know. I think it's I think it's different being a child when it comes out as opposed to being an adult. Because I actually really like the Ewoks. I won't say that I like the Ewoks, but I think they're the least offensive of the, like, creature things they bring to this movie like they're not as bad yeah, they're as, really not bad they're, they're, not, like they're bad. not as bad as the gungans i'll give them they're that they're not as bad as the gungans um i think the critique is fair but i don't think it i, I don't think that the story is broken by the the the, the, mar the merchandising aspects of it um i think you can definitely have a fair balance of both um because I, I bring this up because there's a line that han or i guess not han harrison ford brings up where um, he said, or I think it was implied that um, he'd said that he wanted his character to die. I think we already established that. But um, he said that this was uh, a no-go for Lucas, who, wanted, who, said, who had said something along the effects of, you can't make toys of a dead Han Solo. Damn. And... Okay. That, and, and, and yeah, that's a fair critique, but... That's a critique. All right, that's fair. That's a fair critique. And whether that's actually true that he said it or not, I can't say for sure, but I'm not going to say Harrison Ford is going to make up shit like that. I feel like there's probably some validity to it. But, yeah, no, I, I definitely think that there probably was a push more for toys than there was for, um... Th 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 I think there's more a push for toys than the um, inherent need to tell an, a, a, a perfect story. Um, but I don't think the story that we have is bad by any means. I mean, fucking Transformers is a commercial of uh, an entire commercial 20 minute commercial every week and people still love those things so i don't think you can i don't think it has to be mutually exclusive by any means yeah also like like aside from the ewoks how like uh, like how would the story have benefited from less merchandising like <laughs> i get han like like han's critique of like he really wants to take a care like this character in one way because he feels it makes sense story wise. And George said, allegedly said, no, because that would fuck up the merchandising. <laughs> that's 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 a critique. Yes, that's a critique. But I can't see how the story would be better if Han actually died. I can't see how the story would be better if Luke went 
dark side. You know what I mean? Like, if if there was a much better way that the movie could have been made and we're thinking, oh my God, that would have been ma- amazing, but Lucas was too much of a punk to do it because that would have fucked up his merchandising deal, that would be one thing, but I don't see that. So I can't, I can't put too much credence behind the critique because I don't necessarily agree with it, really. And, and that's fair. And I, but I, th- and I think if the merchandising rights weren't Lucas's alone... Yeah, it probably, <laughs> like, wouldn't that's also feel, it probably wouldn't feel as on point. To, it, like, if that's it, that is a contributing <coughs> factor. Like the yeah. fact that Lucas owned the fucking merchandising. Yeah, like like there could be critiques. Like there could be like comments that Lucas was saying, "Fuck the story, I want to get paid." And how much of that is valid, we don't know. Yeah, I love to sit in a room with George Lucas and just pick his brain for a bit. I think that'd be kind of a fun little afternoon right there. Faster, more intense. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Next one. Does Anakin truly bring balance to the Force, or is it Luke? And is the balance truly achieved? What does it really mean for the Force to be in balance? That's a question that still hadn't been answered in 30, 30 years of books, man. Come on. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so my... My... Like so, like after after all my re- all the reading that I've done, like my my belief is that bringing balance to the Force ultimately required the destruction of the Jedi because the Jedi had been the prevalent force of the the light side, like like the prevalent power of the light side of the Force, whereas the dark side had been almost nearly extinguished. And if the Force is going to be in balance, that means a balance of both light and dark, not just all good things all the time. So in order to actually balance out the Force, I do think the Jedi actually had to fall. But so the fact that Anakin was was quintessential in both the fall of the Jedi, but also the death of the Emperor... I could say I would say an argument would is definitely valid for him actually bringing balance to the force. Yes, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I, and I'm gonna bow to your uh, expertise in that one because, like, like you said, there's 30 years of books to go from, and you know way more about that lore than I do. Um, from from the outside perspective, from from just look at the films. Um, I would say that it's hard to really say because I don't think a balance can truly be achieved um, just like with this one incident, for example. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that the Force... It's talked about in Episode uh, 8, and we'll get to that here in a bit. Um, But Luke said that the Force doesn't belong to the Jedi, it doesn't belong to the Sith, it's it's just this energy that's between all things, like like Yoda said in Episode 5. And... I don't think it can ever really be in balance. I think it's always going to be ba- going back and forth. I think it's always going to be in flux. And I think that's just the nature of the Force. It's just like any other uh, magic entity. It's it, it's not anything meant for one side. It's not anything meant for anybody. It's just this chaotic energy that's between us all that is going to drive the, 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 the momentum of the universe, is all it is. Yeah, and that definitely makes sense when you have... When you have a mythological force and a quasi-philosophical religion based on, like, the, the, the energy and relationships between living beings, then yes, the force is constantly going to be in flux because people are constantly in flux. There are constantly empires rising and falling. There are heroes coming to slay dragons and falling to, to intrigue, like, like, Everything is a back and forth in life. It will never be completely static with equal amounts of good people and bad people doing absolutely nothing because that's what balance would be. It, it's, but it's always going to go back and forth. So I think your argument of there never actually being a balance to the force actually like holds a lot of weight. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, three more questions. And I'm thinking they'll be fairly quick. Knowing what we know about the upcoming Rise of the Skywalker... Do you think the Emperor returns for, uh, how, how do you think the Emperor returns from his death in this film? I don't want him to. <laughs> I don't want him to. We threw him in the reactor, dude. Come on, well, get uh, out of here. So returns does not necessarily mean he's not dead. 
It could it, no. It could mean it's a recording. It could mean it's a clone. It could mean a ghost. It could mean a lot of things. I'm cu- I know. <laughs> I'm curious what you think it's gonna be though. I'm. All right. Um, I would either like it to be in the form of some type of holocron, which is um, it's essentially a a Star Wars repository of knowledge with a limited. AI in it that you can interact with so that you it's it's essentially like one of those crystals from Superman Returns yep. where they have a whole bunch of knowledge in it and whatnot. Um I would say either one of those or the fact that or, or the idea, the concept that like communicating from the dead as a force ghost isn't only a Jedi technique. And so if Kylo is act like starts getting visited by the force ghost of Palpatine. That would be interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna. Jump he doesn't in. deserve it because he's a whiny little bitch. But it's okay. If 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 that were to happen, I would I would be like, all right, all right, all right, I can go with it. So Ryan, I'm gonna jump into a theory here. All right. And this is a theory I got from watching the Funhouse uh, Filmhouse podcast. Uh, so if you guys haven't seen that, check it out. They did a good episode on this, and uh, I believe it was Bruce Green who proposed this, And I, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but I really like this theory, so we're going to throw it out there. So, in episodes... Uh, I'm trying to remember now. Episodes 5 and episodes 8, they have one thing in common, and it is that they have this nexus, this cave, this area that has this dark force power, this dark force energy drawing in our main characters, Luke and Le- and, and uh, Ray, respectively. Mm-hmm. And it's never really explained, at least in the films, uh, they might explain it in the books, uh, but they never explain in the films what these things, are, these, these entities are, the, these, these pockets, these areas. And th- th- they just are there. It's a big mysterious point that interests me. And... We're about to enter a, a ninth film here, and I think I can draw a connection with these, and I like what, what this theory goes. So, the theory is that these pockets are, or these these caves, these pockets, whatever, these dark force nexuses, are the spots where former Sith have died. And their dark residual force energy resides there. Kind of like a force ghost, but instead of being able to go everywhere like Obi-Wan and Yoda do... They're just in this one spot, kind of haunting mm-hmm. the area more than anything. Mm-hmm. And so the mm-hmm. theory is that the Death Star we're going to go back to for Episode Six, where uh, Palpatine died, is being haunted by this same kind of energy. And you're, you're going to see this big, spooky-ass relic of a Death Star on this planet, where his dark force ghost energy is kind of just seeping all over it, basically. And so it'll basically be just a giant dark force cave, more or less. I really like that. <laughs> I very much like that idea. That's going to be my new head cannon <laughs> until we see this fucking movie. I really like that idea. Oh man. And it would it would make sense why we see the clip of Ray as a, as a Sith. Like it, it could be another. It could be like a a, a dark for a dark side nexus kind of illusion where it shows like, uh, imagine the power that you could achieve with the dark side, and then she fucking busts out and like she looks over and she sees herself in fucking dark side form with the, yeah, I like it. I like that. I like that. I hope that happens. Mm-hmm. So uh, shout out to Bruce Green. That's a, that's a very good theory. We love it, and uh, we're, I'm I'm usurping it. It's mine now. <laughs> you, you like like you like you sir have gotten the evac station symbol of approval that is fan fucking tastic i really like that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. really good stuff i'm hoping that's what it is because anything else to me feels like it might be a little cheap but that's yeah. that's really solid stuff uh, but i do like the holocron idea though i think it's very simple and very elegant so if they wanted to do that that wouldn't be out of the ordinary i'd be okay with it like no I, but i but i like i like this one better mm-hmm. because like, I, I really don't want the Emperor to interact with Kylo. I, like, I, I feel like I don't want to give him any credence as a bad guy. So <laughs> here, here's what I want to see, though. Here's, so here's what I want to see. I want this Dark Force Nexus to exist. I want that to be what uh, what Rey encounters. And I want Kylo to encounter uh, the Ghost of Anakin. I want them both to encounter the opposite spirits from the opposite sides. And I want them to see... 
Oh, that would be interesting. It would be very poetic, yeah. and it would be a very nice way to balance the characters out. And it would. I'd love to see Hayden Christensen get some redemption for for the trilogy. I really would. Like, as long as he also gets some acting classes, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. I I I, I count on that. <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> um, okay. Last two questions. Should this should this have been the end of the Star Wars saga? Why or why not? No. No, it shouldn't have. <laughs> so, so you th- um, so you think this new trilogy is worth keeping, regardless of uh, everything else? I didn't say that. <laughs> I did not say that. Um. I don't think six should have been the end because, and again, I'm going to bring up the extended universe yep. because I can. Yep. Um, but the the universe that Lucas created was so open ended and so mysterious and had such room for great stories that it need like more stories needed to be told in this universe, and that's why we had thirty years of books. And I I I'm in love with some of the stories that came out of that idea, out of the desire to really continue the story that, that Lucas started. So I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want like everything to stop at six. Absolutely not. I have more gripes with seven, eight and pot and more than likely nine. I have more gripes with those that are separate from the EU but it's not in the fact that I want more Star Wars stories. I'm always going to want more Star Wars stories. It's really just I, I have an issue with their execution and with the stories they tried to tell. Or the stories that they wanted to tell and then chickened out. But we'll, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. I, I'm curious what you're going to say on those because I do like what Disney's era is doing. But I do think that there are some, there, there are some black spots they need to work on. Black eyes, it, black eyes, yeah. it, 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 it's it's honestly it's mostly nine. It's mostly nine that's coming up. Well, hey, we don't know for sure. There's a lot of good theories out there that don't counteract what, we, what we've gotten so far. But I and do t- agree. I hope that nine does is not a film that's going to retroactively fix everything that quote unquote eight broke because I don't think uh, eight broke anything. I think eight had a lot of good stuff it introduced, a lot of good ideas. Was it perfect? No, not by any means. But I don't think it's wise to appease to the loudest of the fans and just undo all of that. I don't think it's the wisest decision to make. And I'm hoping that Abrams is smart enough not to do that. Um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to preserve my ire <laughs> at the Star Wars fan base. Because you can't have a bunch of people yelling that seven was the same thing as one as as four, and then when they decide to do something different, say no, you fucked it up now because it's not the same. You can't uh, do that. Okay, Ryan, that's, you're, that's, you're that's, pre- that's a taste. That's a taste of next week's podcast, guys. Ryan, you're preaching to the choir here. Okay, you, you don't have to. You don't have to try to convince me. <laughs> This isn't a convincing. This is just me venting because it irks the shit out of me. I agree. I agree. Oh, and we right. and we ha- and we have the next two weeks to discuss it before we get into uh, uh, episode nine. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Last question: Based on the current trends of today's films, could we mm-hmm. have expected a post credit stinger with Boba Fett escaping the Sarlacc pit? <laughs> <laughs> As a, um, a, a stinger right after six, if six came out in twenty nineteen, yes, <laughs> probably, <laughs> Pro- like, pr- probably, honestly, like, like it, it, it wouldn't have been him escaping the Sarlacc. It would have been um, a cut of a bar at Tatooine, and uh, some guy comes in like just like sand, like dripping all off of him. And, like, he's just out of focus, but you can see him remove something and then place a clawed-up Mandalorian helmet on the barkeep. And that would have been it. That would have been pretty cool, too. That would have been pretty cool. Um, And that would have led straight into Disney Plus's new series, The Mandalorian. (laughs) Coming this fall. I will say as much. I have never been on the Boba Fett hype train. I've always thought he's just kind of a shitty side character. But they do him so bad in the movies. They do. The they EU. really do. <laughs> the EU. He's so good. <laughs> like, like, fucking, fucking. Okay, just, just, just. Han's daughter, who becomes a Jedi Knight, like, and, and is, is on the verge of becoming a Jedi Master, has to hunt down and defeat her twin brother, who became a Sith Lord. And who does she go to? Fucking Boba 
bet. Oh, I thought it was going to be Jar Jar Binks. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> she goes to Boba Fett on the Mandalorian home planet, walks right up to him, kneels, and says, teach me how to kill Jedi. Damn. God, he's so cool. And they didn't show any of that on screen. But, yeah, Boba Fett's really cool. And he's really good. I'll, I'll admit, he's like General Grievous and uh, Captain Phasma. They did him dirty. They did. They really did him dirty. They did Captain Phasma so dirty. I'm so mad. Maybe they'll, maybe <sighs> she'll be back in episode 9, but I'm going to doubt it. <laughs> well, well... And we'll talk about this next week. We will. We will. Um, So, yeah, that's all for the discussion notes. Unless, Ryan, there's anything you wanted to bring up. No, no. It'll just become an EU podcast. So let's let's, let's wrap it up. I feel like we should have one of those at some point. I'd be interested in that. Um, Anyway, mail back real quick. If you want to mail us your... uh, If you want to talk to us about the EU and what you think should have been saved from the EU for the movies, uh, you can go to us on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. Leave comments below. Like and share our stuff as well. We'd appreciate that. Reviews are also really good for our uh, uh, presence on the various pop platforms of choice mentioned at the top of the hour. And Ryan, uh, if they want to reach out to us directly with their EU theories or their Rise of the Skywalker theories, where could they email that to? Uh, they can email that to... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. I had an Ewok in my throat. <laughs> um, they can email that to evacstation at gmail.com. No joke. When I was a kid, my dad always went on about how he didn't like the Ewoks at all. And he loves Jar Jar Binks. And I'm just sitting here gobsmacked. I'm like, how? Yeah. How can you <laughs> like Jar Jar over these things? Jar Jar is Man, they were just sen- They were just sentient teddy bears that were, that were, that were throwing rocks at the, at the stormtroopers. It's fine. Honestly, guy, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, moving on to our final segment, we're going to review the film uh, on our usual scale of platinum to shit and all the colors in between. Ryan, this is a strange one compared to what we've seen so far. Where would you think this place is the best? Because where do we have, uh, where do we put Empire last week? I put Empire as platinum. <laughs> okay, I want to say I did two, maybe. I don't remember. Yeah. It's, yeah. Be, it's been a hot minute, guys, since we recorded, okay? Cut me some slack. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting because I was of the assumption that I was going to save my platinum for, for Jedi. Um, and I was just like, yeah, but you know, I rewatched Empire and I don't really want to give out two platinums, but oh my God, this was just amazing. Um, I will go on ahead and definitively, said, and definitively say that Empire is my favorite. It is. <clears throat> As much as I love the the bow that is put on the stories, there is a bit of padding um, in like in this movie. Um, it's good. It's really enjoyable. I mean, I'm with it every step of the way. But it doesn't keep you on the edge of your seat with new revelations and like really good character development like it does with Empire. Um, it's still fantastic. It's still a gold standard in my book, so I'm going to put it at a gold. So for me, uh, like with the prequels to an extent, and with some of the Disney films we'll talk about here in the coming weeks, there's a few moments in this. Fi- there, there are moments in this film that are above and beyond what I want. And um, if it was just those scenes I was ranking, like the whole entire uh, Vader Luke confrontation, Vader, Luke. Yes, yes, that would definitely earn the platinum. It's fucking master class. But, but like we've said, this film has to be ranked as, as a whole, and it does have its baggage. It does have its problems. It's not perfect by any means, but it's definitely still worth your time. Um, I'm going to give this, I want to say gold, but it might be a high silver. I'm kind of in torn in between. I'm going to go gold for now, but I could definitely see myself going either way, depending on my mood. Okay. Okay. All right. That's that's fair. That's that's a fair critique. And like like I said, this this holds a higher place in my heart because this this was my favorite as a child. And the the the, like every time we cut back to Luke and Vader and the Emperor, it's just like, oh shit! All right, what's happening? What's going on? Like they're 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 having philosophical debates while watching his friends die in space. 
and he wants to just strike down the emperor and just end the war, but that would also give in to his anger, which is exactly what the emperor wants. And my dad's not going to sit there and let me do that, so I'm going to have to fight him. That's a whole ass thing, and I love it. So this, yeah, that like it, it definitely it carries a lot of the weight of the movie, but it's so worth it. It's oh, absolutely, so worth it. and. and... To be fair, while I'm putting uh, Empire as a higher ranking movie, I do think I still prefer the aspects of what Return of the Jedi is trying to do. Um, but I have to acknowledge that Re Empire is a better film, technically speaking and narratively speaking, in a lot of ways. So yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll see how these films hold up when we get to the Disney era, because I actually do like what most of the Disney era is doing so far. So I'm looking forward to getting those discussions with you, Ryan, next in the next couple of weeks. We're getting close to Christmas, man. It's it's fucking crazy. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, and then we're gonna be at the end of the year, and man, I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do next. No idea. Yeah. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll have some time to brainstorm. Uh, we'll definitely be asking you guys for your opinion. Uh, so if you guys have anything that you want to see us tackle after uh, we wrap up the year with Star Wars, please go ahead and make a comment below or email us directly at evacstation at gmail.com. We love to hear your feedback, and we would definitely take any, uh, any recommendations you guys have into consideration. I love that Ryan's the one to plug in this time and not me. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next week for The Force Awakens. See you next time. And uh, we'll see you after the credits. <laughs> Bye.